Hello, welcome everybody. Um, good day to you, to our listeners and viewers and those that will be watching this later. Uh, my name is Taiwo Afolabi. Um, I'd like to start by really acknowledging that uh, I am coming to you today uh, from the University of Regina, Saskatchewan in Canada. And it's situated on the territories of the Nahiyawak, Anishinaabe, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakoda, and the homeland of the Mistees and Mischief Nation. And also the University of Regina is a, on Treaty 4 lands with a presence in Treaty 6. I'm really excited about today. Um, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Regina, and um, I have the amazing privilege to be working with um, great um, uh, people and practitioners, dramaturgs and organizations who have sort of team up to work together. So special thanks to HowlRound, special thanks to SafeWord, um, PACE, uh, Pan-African uh, Creative Exchange, um, the Atemus International, and of course, the University of Regina. Today, we're starting the first episode of Dra uh, Decolonizing Dramaturgy. And I have the privilege and the honor to, um, to be engaging with uh, Dr. Fumi Adewoli. Uh, uh, she's a senior lecturer in dance at uh, uh, the uh, Montfort University, uh, Leicester. Uh, she started out as a media practitioner in Nigeria, but, but went into performance on moving to England in 1994. For several years, she toured with physical theater and African dance drama companies before studying for an MA in postcolonial studies uh, and a PhD in dance studies. Uh, she began to work as a dramaturg in 2013, mainly with professional performers, uh, choreographers, uh, mainly choreographers working with dance forms of Africa and the diaspora or what we can also refer to as interdisciplinary theater makers. It's good to have you here today uh, for me. <laughs> Thank you very much, Taiwo. It's an honor to be here. It's very exciting. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Um, what, what we're going to be doing today uh, for me is really, uh, this is a five uh, episode. Um, and today um, it's the first episode. We just want to create, you know, uh, a discourse will be around framing that would hopefully, you know, help us with the remaining four episodes. And uh, I think my first question to you, um, as we get on this journey for the next, you know, 90 minutes or so, uh, is um, uh, uh, what does dramaturgy mean to you? And, and just in a minute before you answer that question, I'd like to also say that we have um, uh, live captioning happening. Uh, Amanda is there uh, behind the screen. And uh, Sarika is there with, as ASL interpreter, thank you. And of course, Tia is there helping us and Brandon, they're also behind the screen, helping us to troubleshoot if there's anything. So just wanna thank you and appreciate all the crew. So over to you for me, what does, what does dramaturgy mean to you? Yeah, well, dramaturgy to me is um, the logic of a, of a performance. And when I say the logic of a performance, in my mind, I'm really thinking about performance in where the physicality, maybe the visuals are as equal importance to the text um, or there's no text, you know, there might be no play script. And therefore the meaning of the performance comes through how code symbols, visuals, movement, the performer's set is being used to convey story or a journey through the piece because it might not be a straightforward linear narrative. And so there has to be a logic that the audience is following in how these symbols or, or props or sets or movements or performers are working together for us to get meaning. And so it's, it's the narrative of the piece, how it's brought together. When I say narrative, I'm using it in, in, a, in a very sort of broad sense. And that structuring is what I will call the dramaturgy of a piece. And um, I remember having a discussion with a colleague uh, or a group of people actually, and someone said something which I agree with. Um, uh, the person said, all, all theater, all, all performance, all performances, not necessarily even theater, all performances um, ha um, have dramaturgy, but not all performances, performances have a dramaturgy. 
And what I mean, what I took from that, and, and I agree with it, and that's why I'm mean, including it in my description, is that not all performances rely on that structuring to convey their message in that explicit way. You know what I mean? So if I, if I put a play on stage with a text, maybe a classical play, um, it, it, it has dramaturgy. Obviously it has a structure, and we're, but is it relying? Is that where all the focus of the performers and the artistic directors was in order to convey meaning? Possibly not. And so, dramaturgy becomes comes to the forefront as, as the focus of a piece when that's what we're relying on for the meaning uh, to be conveyed or you know the experience to be conveyed sometimes interesting um i i do recognize that you know defining dramaturgy is is i, I don't think practitioners or scholars have sort of arrived on a particular definition of it but it's really interesting you're connecting it to the idea of the logic of the performance. So I wonder if there is a specific example you want to kind of just throw in there to help us understand what, what you mean by that logic of performance. You know, is that in terms of the structuration, is in terms of the performance analysis, the script analysis, of obviously for those, um, for and, and, and of course, for performances that are not necessarily scripted, what do you, are the examples you could point to that really speak to the logic of the performance? Well, what immediately comes to mind is a piece by a colleague of mine called, Ale her name is Alexandra Souten. Um, I believe she's performed in Canada before, but she's performed globally. Um, she's a choreographer and a, and a dancer. And um, she's based in Britain, in Belgium, and, and um, she's of Zimbabwean background. And she did a piece called Sosine Panoir, which means this is not black. Um, and she is a black woman of, but of mixed race heritage. Um, and in this performance, she starts off uh, sitting on the stage with her back to the audience uh, with a head wrap. She has a head wrap on her hair and she's I think she's wrapping her hair slowly and as the audience comes in and there's opera moves music playing and uh, and when she finishes and everybody's seated she gets up and she starts talking to the audience and at some point she takes off her head wrap and she passes it to someone uh one of the members of the audience and asks them to pass it around so she asked people to pass this head wrap around and she said, smell it and pass it on. And they do that and she continues performing. And at one point she says, can I have my head wrap? Can I have my head wrap? And then someone from the audience runs on stage, you know, and she says it with such an urgency that the person runs on stage with the head wrap. And, you know, at some other point she's joking with the audience and she says that this head wrap is an African head wrap and, um, it, it, it's, it's made in um, Belgium, you know? And so she's also talking about issues of identity that anyone who sees it on the street with her, they still say it's African, but she was saying it's made in a foreign country. And then in, in, an, in a later part of the piece, she ties the head wrap around her waist and does a particular kind of dance, which is, you know, grounded in, 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 in Southern African culture. And, and towards the end of the piece, she, she, she wraps her hair again. She plays several characters. Now, what I'm saying about how that head wrap, you know, um, contributed to the story of the piece, the piece doesn't have a singular narr narrative at all. She does children's games at one point, she sings into a microphone. At some point she does something that, you know, she, she plays about three different characters, she switches. Um, she, she switches characters, uh, children's um, songs come up, you know, as well as spoken word. But this head wrap is going through the whole piece all the time. And as she transforms, there's this head wrap transforming into something else within that performance. I think in certain times she puts it down and then goes back to get it. And so after a while, you begin to find a link. It's one of the things, not the only thing, but one of the things that creates a cohesion between all the various sections um, in this particular performance. And adds a logic. So while you're seeing all these various 
things you're saying this 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 head wrap becomes symbolic and we begin to see it meaning different things and when it's absent i.e she puts it down you also wonder you still look at it on the chair and say what does it mean now that she's not wearing it you know so that's what i mean about the logic the, the, the that that made the whole performance logical it added a poetic thing you know to it and a symbolism which brought brought so many things from different parts of her life and her experience together so that's why i'm sort of thinking about the logic i think sometimes the logic is very poetical very po you know very metaphorical sometimes and symbolic interesting um, I know you're, you're, it's your turn to ask me your question. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Yes, well, I'm just going to just fling that question back to you. What is dramaturgy to you? Uh, just because also, as um, you said, dramaturgy means different things to different people. And it also um, means different things to people coming from different areas of performance and I as, a, as you said in your introduction I work a lot with choreographers and theatre makers who use dance as well as other aspects so that's where I'm coming from and they're usually people creating work for stage or staging performance even if it's not on stage so I'm coming from there so you from your background and from where you work within performance, how would you define dramaturgy? Well, th thanks for me. Um, um, it's really uh, important where, what you just noted, um, uh, the fact that defining it itself, it's like, a, you know, it's, it's, you know, there is this, um, is this, this um, metaphor that when I was growing up, my father and my mom used to say that if you touch an elephant, um, the, the, the side that you touch would determine what you call it. Yeah. <laughs> if you touch the ear, you define it that it's very smooth. But if you, you know, touch the truck, it's different, right? Um, yeah. And I think that's for me. That's the that's that's the thing about that recognizing that um, its definition. It's you know some see that as a composition um, of you know of of um, of, of different theatrical uh, components. Some see it as a composition of text. In some places, it's regarded as really researching, and you know, some see it as coaching. You know, different, different, different things like that. Also, based on the geography that we're located and the and the and the performance tradition, also defines how we define it. But then, for me, I think it actually goes back to. The uh, how I see dramaturgy, uh, and and of course we're going to talk in terms of where we're coming at this and our own background and all of that. But how I see dramaturgy is really as everything that makes up a, com a dramatic composition, uh, from an aesthetic standpoint, from a political standpoint, and from a humane standpoint. And I'm I'm going to come to that in the, on the question around why decolonizing dramaturgy, because I feel that it, you know when we put a piece on stage or we devise a performance, it's not just the aesthetics of it. But what makes it lot to use your term, the logic of the performance, is that we've considered all of these elements from, from a script standpoint, from a performance standpoint, from a political standpoint, from a historical standpoint, all of what constitute or everything that constitutes that narrative that we're putting on stage, that we're, you know, or putting uh, in you know on on the media whatever all of that that constitute that narrative is for me what what um what I consider as dramaturgy so it's the composition of all of that what that looks like from a political perspective from a historical perspective uh, from an aesthetic perspective from a humane perspective how does all of that come together to becoming that piece that you're just describing that headgear that is being passed from one person to another and is being used as a metaphor, as a symbol to tell a story that when we now see that object, it becomes the epitome, it becomes the summary mm. the metaphor for the entire performance. It's a lot of thinking that goes into that. And I think for me, it's the entire composition that is, that's what I consider as dramaturgy, the process of having all of that in. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you there. And I, but I think, um... The challenge of dramaturgy is to find often few articles 
symbols, words that can carry all that you're talking about, politics, you know, ethics, you know, the, the, the human stories. I mean, and like you said, a lot of work goes into making those choices. I mean, when you work as a dramaturg, sometimes what you're, you're, you're doing when you're talking with the, maybe the artistic director, or even sometimes the company is saying, you've got so much on stage, you know, so much is going on. Where do you want the people to focus? And then you start saying, or, or, or how can we imbue the politics of what we're <laughs> examining into these particular actions or, you know, and sometimes you have to strip some things away or put some other things in the background so that some things come to the forefront. So when we're thinking aesthetically, like, like you were mentioning, we are not only thinking about the aesthetics, we are thinking about, okay. And I think what Alexandra found in that piece was she found, considering what she was trying to talk about, because when she says, Susina Panua, this is not black. I think she was talking about the complexity of being a black person. That's right. And you know, you know, there's this famous painting where uh, a pipe is, um, I think a pipe is painted in the, in the picture and underneath mm -hmm. is written, this is not a pipe. You know, mm -hmm. so I think she was she was playing off of 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 that particular artwork, but then she's a mixed race woman who does who looks like a black woman who does not have a white parent, but she has a white parent. So she's talking about the complexity of being black, and the head wrap is something that sort of symbolizes this complexity. It could be made in different parts of the world, but it's still considered African. You know, women, you tie it on their waist. They tie their baby on their back with it. They tie it on their hair. When they're going to fight you, they tie it around their, their you know? So this head wrap is utilized in so many forms culturally and, and, and that was embodied. So it then become, it then, then takes a political resonance. And I, I think what you're saying, dramaturgy bringing all these elements together, but the, 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 what the theater company has to struggle with or is how do you choose the logic, how do you create a situation where people logically can see what you're trying to say with a few select items or actions or text. So it's this condensation that sometimes happens. Interesting. Uh, speaking about uh, condensation and, and kind of focusing and framing, I, I, I wonder if you can speak to your professional journey to, to, to dramaturgy, at least to, to kind of give our you know, listeners and viewers that context where we're coming at. Um, and, and, and before you do, I just want to say for those uh, for our listeners, if you have questions, please uh, put it in the chat. We'd be happy to. This is, uh, there's going to be a Q&A where we're going to be engaging with the questions. So feel free to put your questions in the chat and we'll back for sure get it across and, and, we, um, and, and answer them. So back to you for me. What's your, what's your professional journey to dramaturgy? I, I know that right now you're, you're co-creating, you know, um, uh, at, at the pace, you know, Pan-African Creative Exchange, Dramaturgical Lab. I do know that, but what, what's your, what's your, you know, professional journey to dramaturgy? Okay, I, I would say my first professional job started from 2013, but I would say um, two, I would say um, two things uh, uh, brought me into dramaturgy. One, I would say um, in my career, what was most valuable is that I've worked from various uh, various perspectives within, I've had various roles within performance and within media. And um, because there's something in dramaturgy which is about translation, you know, something about um, how do I make this idea readable to an audience? Um, how do I make this idea that the artistic team or how do we make this readable? How do we make this experience um, something that the audience can receive or be part of? So there's an idea of translation there. And I would say it's because, because I've had quite a varied career. So I'll, I'll give an example. I actually studied languages. So I studied English and French. I don't say that too loudly because my French is awful. Um, now, <laughs> I graduated years ago, I never used it. So um, I did English and French, so I did quite a lot of literature, but then I was 
in the theatre and I took courses in theatre and communication. So my education was quite broad at university level. And then after that, um, I worked as a journalist in newspaper, print and television. And then when I came to Britain, I started touring because um, I started touring with theatre companies. But then I started touring with um, experimental companies. And then I was uh, tra traditional African dance drama, what people are calling traditional African dance drama, which can be quite modern, actually. <laughs> then I danced with bands. Then I did all straightforward plays, um, what we call physical theatre. Um, and then I because I had a background as a journalist, I worked in Nigeria as a journalist for a while. I started writing about dance and that took me into a lot of conferences with people and arguing about meaning. And um, then um, I decided to do an MA in post-colonial studies. And then I started studying teaching. I, I mean, I became a teacher, so I did, uh, I did a course in teaching. And I would say it's jumping from these different roles that um, helps me to look at things and say, mm, this, this is the meaning I think you might be trying to convey here. Also, you know, being in the production, but also being on the creative team sometimes. So I would say that helped. The other thing, I would say my life, the fact I was born in Britain, I grew up in Nigeria, then I went back to Britain. I think that kind of journey, but I would also say the journey of living in Lagos, which is a cosmopolitan city, then coming for me Lefe. Even that was a process where I'm translating ideas, you know, and translating how I present myself and speak and, and be understood or misunderstood and deal with that, you know? And um, also, I think the fact that I didn't train, my first degree is not in performance, it was in languages. The basis of my technical training, I came, came from a social world. It actually came from <laughs> dancing, I would say what people might call urban dances. So there was a translation of that, directors asking me to turn what was a social dance technique into something which was legible as an artistic practice. So all these modes of translation. And it didn't necessarily make me a good creator of work. I was a very good interpreter of work when I was touring, but not necessarily a good creator. My first piece, um, um, which I did, and this is the second experience, um, it in a physical theater festival, it went down well, but then I performed in a dance um, festival and people were like, uh, you know, um, didn't go down too well. But then afterwards, a choreographer um, approached me and said, I saw your piece. Could you be my outside eye? Could you be my dramaturg for my next piece? And she said, it was not, it didn't matter for her that it didn't go down so well for the audience. What mattered to her was what she could see was the skeleton of what I was putting together, which made her feel I could understand where she was going. So I would say that's what, those are the things um, that sort of developed me as a dramaturg and her asking me to come and be her dramaturg opened the door to me to understand there was a need for the role. And then I started you know, being invited. So, yeah, that's how I came into, into dramaturgy. It, it's interesting because when we speak about formal education, uh, in the formal training, rather, in the context of dramaturgy, how much of that do we have in the world uh, uh, in terms of availability, right? And then mm -hmm. it seems, and I, I'm not 100% I'm not sure of it because uh, I've never done research around uh, how many people that consider themselves as dramaturg actually had a professional or you know formal training in dramaturgy it seems a lot of folks that you know that come at this come at this from a different whether cultural social work or their work in the creative industry and all of that but then you're kind of speaking to that interdisciplinarity of experience from a professional standpoint and of course even your own pro you know, personal experience journey that gives you that robust lens to, to really ask questions. Because I think one of the yeah. one of the job of a <laughs> of a dramaturg is to really ask questions. That yeah. can be blunt at times. It can sounds like, "Where well, can't you see that?" But like, no, I can see. It, but I'm asking so that you can, <laughs> as a creator, you can articulate it. Is that what you want to do? You know, 
and and then that also helps you to create and curate a structure for a perspective perspective uh, for the interpretation of work. So whether you're standing, you know, on the outside or you're telling, you know, and telling creators about the experience or what you think it means, uh, you know, or you're supporting them, you like that soundboard or you're helping them to understand where they're coming from and consider from different political and historical perspective, helping them to, so that they can, to enhance the interpretation of their work. It sounds to me, what I'm hearing is that that interdisciplinary lens is very critical. Yeah, I think it is. And I, I think, yeah, as we were saying, because as you're saying, you're looking for the logic of the performance. That's right. And um, when you're working with artists that um, are interdisciplinary, the, there's not a, um, a fixed way of creating the performance. They might be standard and, and, and readily uh, known conventions or ways of making, but many a time when they start the performance, they don't know what it's going to look like at the end. And that might be very different from how you would create a play. You know, sometimes at the beginning of a play, you can sit around a table, you can look at the play text, you can say, okay, it's going to be in the 15th century. What did they wear in the 15th century? You put that down. Um, we're going to make it look like this. It's going to be two hours long, and you work. It's it's more um, it's more known. It's what you're going to end up with, but with certain plays, especially uh, performances, especially the ones that are interdisciplinary, you're not too sure what this is really going to look like. So, what creates the logic? What what creates the logic of this piece? And um, like you were saying, we're going to talk about the politics of it. What does it mean? What's this, what, do, what do this the art forms or dance forms that we're bringing into it, what do, what do they mean? And what would they mean in this piece? <laughs> do you know what I mean? That's right. And, 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 and how are we gonna frame it that we, the audience doesn't just impose a meaning on them and that they retain maybe the potency that we feel they have. If not, they might just be stereotyped and considered pretty things and we might say no 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 we want them to have a certain edge so how do we do that so those questions are coming and then for example you know some people I've, I've I know of a choreographer who said he decided to go on on stage with um, he, he he was doing traditional African dance a, a traditional African dance but he said he will go on stage and he won't wear uh, the costume or the clothing that usually goes with that dance because the audience will automatically say, oh, isn't it a nice cultural display? A display? Oh, lovely heritage and just sit back. And, and he wanted to challenge them. So he went on in a dull white uh, cloth. People were expecting color and it forced the, you know, and then at one point they stopped the drumming and it was dancing in silence. And we don't expect someone doing traditional dances to be dancing without percussion. So it forced people to put aside their idea of carnival and say, okay, he's obviously tell, trying to tell us something else and then have a readiness to listen. So the way he uh, dramatized the piece was to play with the idea of sound and audio and visuality so that people would see him as a performer who has something to convey. So there was, you know, he found that in rehearsal. He, he it was in rehearsal. Maybe after two or three um, performances and not getting the the kind of feedback he wanted, then in rehearsal, you know, someone said, "It's this costume that's the problem. It's this costume that has framed you in a way that we are we can't we can only engage with your culture, but not with your message." Okay, I stripped that off interesting you know so mm. yeah i think so it's the lens you know he might you know i think if he went to maybe an african country or an african city was performing in europe and he danced with the costume people might still hear him because that costume doesn't transport them to a fantasy land you know yeah. what i mean and exercise him so yes right they could say <laughs> what he had to say and they would listen but once he lands, you know, in the middle of, I don't know, an English village with that, you know, their minds might go to holiday brochures or they might even go to Oxfam. The safari is in, yep. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> it's, it's that kind of thing. Interesting. 
Okay. Wow. Uh, we come yeah. to dramaturgical skills because we're going to land on that in the next round. Uh, yeah, but don't I have to ask you a question? I have a question to ask you because, again, uh, from the point of view that we work with different types of performance. So I want to ask you the question about, I know you've told me you work with various communities. I know that. And I'm aware that maybe some of these communities they're not really, they, they are, they're au fait with the concept of performance, but they're not thinking in terms of dramaturgy. So what circumstances made it important to you to start thinking about dramaturgy in terms of the groups of people and groups of performers you work with? Absolutely, uh, thanks for me. Um, I, I would wanna start by saying that um, I, uh, so my, my own former training kind of, and it was really encompassing both Western and non-Western canons. And I'm really grateful for that. I did my undergrad at University of Joss. Um, uh, and of course I'm from Ileife also. So you, you know, you're, yeah, I know. <laughs> in, in Ocean States, Nigeria. Um, and so you're, there is that consciousness around the culture, the heritage, even though you, you, know, you do not necessarily participate in, in the carnivals and the festivals and all of that, but there is that awareness all over the place. Um, and of course, I did my undergrad in JOS and my master's in, 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 in University of Illinois before I did my PhD at University of Victoria. But what's interesting also in all of that is that you're sort of introduced from a professional standpoint to Western and non-Western canons. I was introduced to that. But then because my own work kind of focuses on in community, community engagement, um, critically working with so you know, quote and unquote unprofessional who are interested in a particular subject and we were engaged in applied theater, you know, to go and educate or to engage with that community to devise a piece. Most of the time it's not scripted. But then what happened is that in that process of community engagement, collective and creative exploration, there is some sort of dramaturgy happening right there. Uh, there is um, um, a practitioner here in Canada uh, with the name Sadie Berlin talk about the idea of cultural dramaturgy. Um, and, and according to, you know, uh, and that means really engaging with the historical, really asking critical questions that are just beyond the script, but really that are looking into those nuances, those complexities um, that those scripts really carry. But then when we go to community, I work in community, I realized that Many times they are actually the one dramaturging the piece for me. So I had I have this example. I was working with this community uh, some couple of years ago uh, in in Canada, and then um, it, it was an indigenous indigenous community, um, and then really amazing people had a great time with them, and then I was I was sort of you know creating with them, and because of aesthetics, there was this particular word that I wanted us to change you know and all of that and they said no no pause no we can't change let's go we have to wait for one of our elders so they you know they mentioned the elder's name and then we stopped that day and then the elder came the following day and then she sort of schooled us and she said the reason why we cannot change this even do from an aesthetic standpoint it's going to be beautiful and all of that is that if we change the pronunciation of this name of this particular word We've changed a history. Mm. It means that we're passing, and this is and it, this particular river is actually what points to the fact that this land here belongs to us. So you know, at that point, I'm like, oh, what? I, that's interesting because you know, I, I would claim that I, you know, I'm asking all the ethical questions, all the I'm trying to ensure that all the political, um, you know, components are being taken care of. I'm constantly critiquing my own work and all of that. But then that hit me to a pause. I started thinking the role of the community that I'm working with, the role of the civilization and the experiences of the group that I'm working with, how does that shape the devising and the creative process for me? So I'm coming at it, not necessarily from the professional standpoint, uh, professional theater, but in, in really that unscripted territory, in community work where we're constantly engaging with people that are really doing this out of passion. They just want to, they're interested in, you know, 
health issues, so let's create something, or interested in immigration, or they're interested in language revitalization, they're interested in it because of their own uh, connection to it, not necessarily because it's a professional, you know, um, component to it, not at all. Mm. So that, that's actually what brought me to start thinking about, you know, thinking about dramaturgy from that point of view, that in what ways, you know, how can, and, um, um, and, and I will come to this in why decolonizing dramaturgy. And the key question for me then is, what is the role of the dramaturg in a place of protest and in a time of political and social polarization? Within my work as a as a as you know as a divisor as a community you know connector as a nurturer in community as, as also a learner you know in community through my work that's why that's what brought me to mm. dramaturgy and it seems like uh, you're formulating a um, I would say maybe a philosophy of dramaturgy um, in terms of the dramaturgist listener here. Uh, absolutely. And um, the role of listening in dramaturgy. I think all from all dramaturgs working with any group is listening, but maybe if you're going into a cultural, culturally Pacific situation where people are drawing on a hist the, the joint history and um, things of value, you know, landscape of value and how they want their words to be said pronounced and used within a performance then i then listening i think becomes a very strong value mm -hmm. and skill mm. because some other people could have i mean i i um in a in a situation um made a mistake once where i wanted the performance ready by a certain time and I didn't pick up the cues from the cast that they were sort of a bit uncomfortable about one or two things. And I was like, we've got to close, make a decision, put, uh, you know, put, put it together so we can do the presentation. So when we have the feedback session, they'll say, oh, day one, you were great. Day two, you were great. Three, four, five. But on the day of the performance, you became something else because you wanted the performance <laughs> to happen. And I sort of stopped listening. And I think at, at, at that point, if I had listened, I maybe we would have presented it differently. You know, we, mm. there would have been a different presentation. And I think listening is even more crucial if you're working as a dramaturg, because as a dramaturg, you're not the artistic director. You're not directing people around, but you're helping them you're helping your uh, your artistic director, or it may be in this case a group, an artistic group, whether they're paid professionals or not, to bring forward what's most important, what they think is most important to tell their story, and in a way, it gives you a constraint, you know, in, in, in the sense of that has to be central to the dramaturgy. You know that this what they've said about this river. That's right. It has to become a, an important part of it. That's and right. then maybe that's the headache of the artistic director and the dramaturg to figure out how it is done, but they have told you what is important and what right. and, and what will convey um, the, the story. So it seems to me that from working in this field of applied theater, there, there's a particular approach to dramaturgy that you might be advocating here. It, it's a possibility, uh, but but then also just thinking in terms of what that experience sort of helped me to really think about uh, bigger issues, right? Like the 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 especially in a system in a culture where many times you know I, I think things are changing gradually, but there is so much attention on Western canons. Um, there is you know. Where, where there is need to re-centralize or you know, decentralize whichever way we want to, um, and to start rethinking the notion of relationship, the notion of responsibility, the notion of reciprocity, where we need to start you know, really understanding what listening silence means, power relations, political realities, the aesthetics and the humane components of, of our interaction. You know, that experience kind of helped me to, to start thinking about those things that perhaps dramaturgy can give us a way in to all of these conversations. 
Uh, and and I will I will I will use that to, as a springboard to actually ask my next question for you, uh, to you rather. That based on your on your because uh, you, you did mention listening as as one of well I'm I'm considered as one of dramaturgical skills. <laughs> um, so based on your interest in dramaturgy and of course your practice uh, in the Pan African Creative Exchange Dramaturgical Lab, I would like you to speak to you know briefly what what you mean by. Um, what are the dramaturgical skills, really? What, mm -hmm. what, what do you mean by that? And what, what are those skills that you think from your own experience you can consider as dramaturgical skills uh, uh, in your work and in your you know, interaction and your work with different uh, artists and uh, theatre companies? Yeah, um, in talking about dramaturgical skills, I, am, I will be referring to the skills of a dramaturg. Uh, as someone who is often considered the outside eye of a production that comes into the production on invitation from usually the artistic director or the choreographer or the creative team to be an outside eye. So they're in a sense, not part of the production crew um, in that they don't make the decisions usually but they offer or they try and get the artistic director to look at broaden, maybe broaden their outward look or to challenge their, um, their perceptions, you know, or challenge their, the way they're approaching the making of a piece. Um, and so they come in as the outside eye they make, and they're used in different ways in many respects. So I think as a dramaturg, a dramaturgs, tend to have to be very flexible in that what company A may invite them to do might be very different or quite different from company B, but there's a need from someone from the outside who, un who understand and empathize with the process and empathize with what they're trying to make to come in and support the process. Now, support the process to do what? So I think a key dramaturgical skill is to understand positionality, I would say. You know, I was talking about dramaturgy being, in some respects, a process of translation. You're translating something, um, aesthetics, ideas, politics, whatever, into, uh, into the performance and in such a way that the audience can uh, perceive it, can, can read it, you know, can give it some kind of interpretation. And you're trying to also encourage a way that it can be framed that they can't escape, you know, the perspective that maybe the, the artistic director wants to put forward. So you, so understanding positionality, you know, um, is key. Who are they and who are they speaking to? And it might not be you. It might not be you, the dramaturg, that is the first primary person they're trying to communicate to. So you can't necessarily interpret it from what you like, you know, because it might not be uh, what's very important. Why do they want to say what they're saying? Will how they're saying it communicate what they're doing? How they're performing it, will it communicate? So I think it's understanding your role is a key dramaturgical skill. I think it's understanding communication. I think that's a key dramaturgical skill. So who are they? Who are they speaking to? Listening. Because sometimes what they say, people, some people, like the community you spoke about, they're very clear. But sometimes people are not very clear. They're saying they want A, but really they want B. And it's not that they're necessarily lying to you. It's just that there's a lot of pressures on them and they're saying, oh, this is not working. Why is it not working? Oh, you know, the musician is not doing what I say. You look back and you think, well, actually, maybe the problem is not the musician. It could be the dancers. You know, <laughs> maybe we should talk to the dancers. So I think it's understanding process enough and how artistic things come together enough to, to because you're on the outside and you're not so tied into the production, you can say, have you thought it might be this process that is blocking that process? So it's um, also having that awareness of dynamics, 
so one communication other one dynamics of 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 artistic teams maybe the dancers or the 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 divisor is is keeping mute because they're afraid of the artistic director so they can't get the performance that they want from this person because they're afraid and why are they afraid you might need to talk to the artistic director about that you know so you need to understand a bit about the dynamics of how perform performances are put together and then um, nonverbal um, how um, the different practices of representation are interrelating you know um, you know if I do a dance in silence that's going to mean something different than if I do a dance with music and if I do it if I do the same dance with a live musician pre present it's different from if it's a recorded music. There's all these different ways of, co of combinations that, uh, you know, um, is, is worth knowing about. But I would, um, I would say it's not necessarily being an expert in, expert in everything, expert in communication, expert in the dynamics of an artistic company and an expert also in how the different elements are interacting. You might not be an expert in all of these things, but you know their importance. So you too can ask the question. Mm. Is there a reason why you've insisted that everybody is wearing this costume? Oh no, we decided to use this costume because it was there in the cupboard. Well, maybe you're going to have to think about getting another one. Or if you use this costume, you might be given this particular perspective. Oh, we never thought of the costume. Do you see what I mean? So you might not know everything, but you know what's important. So you can ask questions. So you can get people to think about things, you know? Um, and I think being aware of the power of being the outside the power of being on, on, on the outside is that you can have that, you know, overview that maybe the artistic director, because they're so engaged, so in it, so this, so that they can't, they can't, they needed the support to come back and see. So those are what I think uh, are skills that are necessary, that those are the knowledge you need. And then the skill, you need the skill to communicate it without creating a, a fight. So the idea of being an outside eye, a nurturer, a listener, a coach sometimes, uh, a, a sparring partner. And in the Pace Dramaturgical Lab, actually where we are coming from the point of view of how, do pe how does the dramaturg um, relate and support the team in these various in these various roles interesting um i know that you you also and, and later in the app in in the series are going to be uh talking about you know dramaturgical skills and creative process from different part of the continent africa i mean by continent and also a dramaturg as a nurturer as a programmer do you want to speak to those things quickly i know that those are also concepts that you're considering from you know in dramaturgical lab yeah, um, I think I I try and read about dramaturgy when I when I when I find a book, and it it's one of those um, areas that I like you. There's not many courses and not many texts, but there's one text I found very um, very useful, and the writer speaks of institutional dramaturgy, which I find very interesting. Oh. and and that is thinking about how the production or the performance sits in the institutional, the ecology, you know, of, of theater. So it's in a particular venue, for example. Um, that venue itself gives a framing, you know, to the, for, for the piece. You know, if I put something in certain venues in London, they will say, oh, it's very, very high class, high art. If I put it in another venue, oh, it must be a theater piece, or it must be a, activist piece because it's in this venue you know so even how things are presented um are 
starts giving the audience some kind of meaning because you're framing in it, framing it from where you place it. And that's why it, um, we are looking at the whole idea of artists as, you know, uh, as the dramaturg, as curator, because sometimes the dramaturg is invited to work almost in a curatorial um, position of how do we frame the production? How do we, what do we put in the uh, program notes? Or if we're gonna have a Q and A, uh, um, who do we get to ask the questions? And, you know, do we need a Q and A? You know, that kind of thing. And the dramaturg might be invited to actually lead the Q and A. Um, if you're programming work, there is a dramaturgical uh, thing happening, an aspect there, because you're, you're deciding to put it in your theater, or you're deciding to put it in a program with maybe three other or four other pieces. Those, and, and when people see those four productions together, they might make a decision as to what this whole program is about. So it's a, there's an issue of what do you select to go into the program? So yeah, so we're looking at programming, we're looking at dramaturg, you know, in the funding role, there's a dramaturgical aspect. And, and you know, why, all, why all, all of this is important for theatre makers working on the African continent? Uh, one of the reasons why PACE, uh, the Pan-African Creative Exchange put up the lab, for example, is, is the knowledge that many theatre makers of different types are working with dramaturgical skills, are working in dramaturgical roles without using that name. You know what I mean? And they, they, there is less support for them in, de, in developing the, those, the, the, that role or those skills um, than for, for other roles. So, you know, it's easier to get a course teach where you learn directing or you learn, um, you know, choreography, or you learn to dance or to act, it's easier to get uh, people to, to train you or teach you in that, than to support you in these roles, where, which people are doing, you know, they are doing, but there hasn't been much of a space within academia, or within the professional uh, associations, where these skills are recognized and supported you know, um, and seen as valuable, you know, people do them in the guise of being an artistic director and as a, as part of the many, many things they're doing. So I think it's important that the, um, some platform is given to, and space is given to that form of expertise. Wow, interesting. Okay, um, I know you're meant to ask me a question now, so, yes. um, Let's yeah. do it. So, am I free to move on to why you have called for the decolonization of dramaturgy? Because uh, absolutely. You, you're, you're the curator of this web series and uh, the person who, who has decided uh, or invited us to, to talk on dramaturgy, you know, in relation to decolonization. Um, so what, what 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 inspired this idea? No, absolutely. Th thanks for me. So um, when I had the initial call for paper on decolonizing dramaturgy, I think it was sometimes last year. Um, for me, I was really thinking about the fact that um, dramaturgy is not peculiar to Western performance tradition, even though, and I, and I stand to be, you know, I put my ignorance on the table here. I, I'm not I'm not all over the continent of Africa. 54 countries, I've not been to all of them. But my interaction with a lot of prof uh, practitioners from that part of the world is we, 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 we really talk about dramaturgy. Um, perhaps maybe that's part of what we do, the things we do. But then also the fact that like you rightly mentioned in terms of academia, um, you know, um, resources available are, are not the same way, you know, in terms of dramaturgy when itself. But then my own working, so I do understand that you know dramaturgy is not peculiar to Western performance tradition, um, and that's because different theater traditions they have ways in which dramaturgical performances and practices and processes are really you know put in place. So uh, you know regardless of cultural context, for example, and creative content, the dramaturgical process requires thorough you know thorough investigation, 
thorough inquiry, robust research on biased explorations of um, you know, various intercultural and, and various aspects of people's history, community existence and all, and things like that. Uh, and of, also, I, I also, from my own work in community, I understand that the dramaturgical process and by dramaturgical pro process, I, I mean um, the telling, the adapting, the staging, the uh, be performing of stories of people in many cultures really require looking into the cosmological, the cultural components and all of those things. So for me, I started thinking, a lot, you know, how much of those nuanced ideas do we consider when we think about dramaturgy? One, two is that decolonizing dramaturgy for me uh, might give us an opportunity to speak about some of these things in a different way. And so that's why I started considering the three things I mentioned earlier on the political components, the aesthetic components and the humane components of mm -hmm. what I mean by decolonizing dramaturgy, because in all of those three levels, you find that as part of the dramaturgical process, all the, pro the, the skills needed, or the areas to consider in dramaturgy, in when you're questioning and all of that. So it, it sort of seemed to me that you know, when drafted in, into community engagement like me um, and, and the, you know, activist settings like, you know, applied theater and device theater and, and things like that, I feel like one of the major role of the dramaturg is, you know, is what um, I think it's Jeffrey S. Proil um, uh, calls the nuances of listening. And I think he talked mm. about listening earlier on. So for me, I started thinking perhaps on two things. One is that calling for decolonizing dramaturgy as a lens to rethink dramaturgy, that what are those things that are missing that we're not talking about? Not just niche alone from a professional standpoint, but even when we're engaging with community. Two is that a lot of practices that does not necessarily fall within the context of, um, of professional theater but that fall within the context of community engagement, perhaps dramaturgy can help us to start thinking in terms of all the bigger issues around ethics of engaging with them, right? Around um, the politics of engagement, around um, the power dynamics, around the historical realities that surround where things are at, you know, where they are at, um, in, in their own existence. So for me, the reason why I'm, I, I'm calling this, you know, really decolonizing dramaturgy is to take on a decolonial lens to dramaturgy. What does that mean when we shift our gaze away from the Western canon and start looking at dramaturgy or the role of a dramaturg from those, you know, those spaces of questioning, of listening, of you know, adapting, translating, like you rightly said, using your words now in, 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 in telling those stories. And to wrap up that question, you know, there's this particular, um, uh, I mentioned uh, him earlier on, um, jo um, Geoffrey S. Pro, that said something that was kind of very interesting that I'll just read it out quickly. It said that the, the central significance of having someone called a dramaturg work on a production, and for me, by production, I'm extending that to, you know, working in community on scripted plays, whether Western or non-Western canon, is that attracting the name to a living presence encourages everyone involved in a production to attend more carefully to what is ever present and often under-examined. The inner workings of a play, a performance, a device piece, for a play's dramaturg is not it's not so much a simple given as a range of possible um, waiting, but to interact with the sensibilities of its creator. And by creator here, I'm referring to those communities. I'm referring to the elders that, that had to tell us, stop, this is what this means. So in, 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 to wrap your question, my response to your question up is that I think my, my calling for, um, uh, 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 decolonizing dramaturgy is really to create that space for us to ask ourselves, what's the role of a dramaturg right now in this system where we find ourselves in this so much 
political and cultural polarization and there's so much intense and um, um, a society. Uh, what's the role of a dramaturg when we put on a decolonial lens too and embrace other, you know, other kind of skills that are needed in exploring and effectively performing the role of a dramaturg? What if we do that from the epistemologies of the South? What, what would that mean? Okay. Yeah, I had, I had, I, the, I mean, what you've just said inspires a lot of ideas, but before I, I, um, I share those, I would like you to, 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 to speak about what do you think is blocking that at the moment? That you are already out there working in communities. You've been doing that for several years and you know others um, doing that both in Africa and other parts of the global South. So since there's so many of you, or, you know, who are qualified and doing this work, why do you think it's not being spoken about? What is what is making this work or this dramaturgy invisible that we should decolonize, if you see what I mean? So what are the forces or dynamics, yeah, that mm -hmm. are, are there? Yeah, interesting. Yeah, thanks for, me for that question. Um, I know there are many people that are working in community, um, in, 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 in interacting and creating with community and also with uh, a constant and drive towards device theater, unscripted pieces and all of that. I think that many, you know, work, many folks working in that space, uh, you know, I won't say whether we're qualified, you know, and all that. Um, you know, not necessarily expert here. Um, but I think maybe, maybe, you know, and, and I'm postulating here, I'm just, you know, just, you know, putting out ideas here. Uh, because that's what we're hoping to and tackle, you know, as we move forward in the series, is that uh, I think the first thing for us is that the community we're engaging with, and, and I think you and I kind of, when we spoke about this some couple of days ago, um, you know, this was rightly, you know, mentioned and clearly articulated, that the community we're working with are really not, maybe not really interested in this discourse, because again, like I said, they're, it don't, it's not, they're not interested in talking about dramaturgy, they're interested in engaging with that performance and they move on. Um, so, so that's there. But then I think it's our part, perhaps part of our old, part of our roles as practitioners and, and scholars, um, you know, whether from a Western standpoint of thinking about scholarship or from a non-Western standpoint of thinking about scholarship, um, is, is that our, our, I, you know, I feel that perhaps part of our role is to start articulating um, these realities so that we can, first of all, bring those epistems, those ways of being and ways of knowing and ways of doing things that are so, sort of on the merging or the periphery, bringing them to amplifying them and bringing them to the limelight. Yeah. The, not necessarily to the center, because yeah. I think center has to constantly be decentralized because that's always that constant power shift. That's one. I also think too is that there is so much uh, emphasis upon professionalism and what is considered profession and what is not, and 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 that's a I think that's going to be a long time conversation with amateur and community work and all of that. But then I think ultimately is that what in our work in community, um, and now that we're constantly talking about community-based research, uh, talking about scholarship within on the fringe and, and things like that, what are the things can we can learn from working in community and start bringing them to that limelight so that we can start on settling what dramaturgy is from a particular lens? So I think that, um, you know, those are kind of two things that I'm kind of owning on to right now is maybe, maybe that's why we're not talking about it or maybe not necessarily that why we're not talking about it, but that, that's more reason why we're graphic. I am gravitating towards that, mm -hmm. that um, to inspire and to create that space for us to start thinking about those that are not necessarily working within the professional sense or with professional actors and all of that, but are working in community and we know that power sits in that community also knowledge sits there. How can we unveil that? Um, not in an extractive sense, because I have to be also careful in that sense, right? It's not a good and collect it. It's again, that's what I'm considering on those three levels of the political, where they're at, you know, looking at historical, our own positionality, which you rightly mentioned, 
looking at it from an aesthetic standpoint, the, you know, the beauty of the performance and all of that, and looking at it from the humane perspective, so that it's about relationality, not transaction, it's about reciprocity, it's about responsibility, and start asking ourselves the ethics of working with community and help us to start speaking about those bigger ideas and concepts, I hope. Yeah, I mean, what you're saying, um, it resonates with me on several levels. Um, one is how we, you know, the whole idea of how we produce knowledge, um, which epistemology has a lot to do with. And like you said before, you work in applied theater, you work with communities. And I often look at applied theater work and productions and see them as very multi dimensional things. The applied theater discourse or in, in, in dance, we have a similar thing, we call it community dance. And when, and, and a, a community dance, um, one of the definitions of community dance is a professional dance artist goes to a community of non-professionals and facilitates them to create a production. So there's usually the professional in the sense that somebody is paying them or they come from an institutional setup where it's where it's recognized that they're doing a certain kind of professional work. Even if they're not being paid, they might decide to do it voluntarily, for example. And so that's how we look at it. So we do see a sense of someone, someone is a professional and this community is not necessarily profe professional. And that doesn't mean they're not excellent performers. It just means they are not being paid to do it. I mean, they're not being paid to do it and they were not necessarily trained to do it, you know, they do it. Um, the training is part of their everyday life and and things like that. But what I'm what 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 you're telling me makes me look at sometimes at applied performance and know that yes, it's possibly for the purposes of um, uh, what is it spreading messages. Uh, okay, there's a health issue and the community needs to discuss this health issue and send out certain messages about it and people relay it to development. But the kinds of things you've been talking about here are not necessarily part of that development issue. Do you see what I mean? It, you're not talking about uh, the health message that uh, the community is talking about or well, we want to introduce, uh, we want to do something against poverty, you know what I mean? So we want to get the community together to, to do that, or, or the marriage of underage, uh, girl, uh, underage uh, girls. Um, so we do a community performance with it in order to, to change the minds of the community or to get them to um, express their points of view on these issues. You're also talking about cultural things, historical things, cultural artifacts, ways of life, cosmo cosmologies. And these things are often not discussed so much. So I think in my knowledge of applied theater, that is not the, the focus. The focus is usually the message, the development. And that's why I'm saying that the applied theater is multidimensional. Yes, we have this message of development, but there's these other things that the community are bringing to it. These other knowledges the community bring into it that are left out of this discourse. So for me, I find it exciting that the topic of dramaturgy can bring these other aspects that are often left out when we're talking about um, community dance or applied theater, they're often left out. These aesthetics and their relationship to the philosophies of that community, the spiritualities of the community or the, um, the, or the aesthetics of that community, often left out. But the word drama dramaturgy can create a space where we can start discussing those kind of things. So that's um, one thing I'm finding interesting and quite um, um, exciting here. 
The other thing it brings to the fore for me is this whole idea of what I call the public space. And it's something I, I have been researching. And I've been looking at the whole idea of the artist as an artistic citizen, as a, as, a, um, as a cultural citizen, as a global citizen. And, you know, the thing about professional art, uh, professionally art funded, subsidized, sub funded by the government, funded by, uh, you know, a funding body, or even, you know, a commercial sponsored, so it's staged and people are, are paid to create it, is that this is the art that gets the voice. This is the art that the journalist turns up to review. You know, I can dance all I like in a nightclub or I can dance, you know, all I like in the street. No one really will review that performance, you know. But if I uh, stage it, like the local government is involved in my dancing in the street, it's possibly that it might be reviewed or, you know, it, people might write about it and it gets that, gets that um, focus. So I think there's a power in a professional performance working with a community because it brings that community in contact with this institutional framework, this public space where we discuss things, you know what I mean? And I think, I think the, the power in what you're saying that dramaturgy can open a space for a new epistemology to come into uh, institutions and create different types of dialogue with uh, those in the public space and the community is because a professional can do that translation. And I, 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 I do see the point of why you say there needs to be an ethics involved so that it doesn't just become something of extraction. So we grab the interesting dance move and we just shift it to our curriculum and we sort of forget them in the past. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it, 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 dramaturgy here is mean, showing the potential of opening different, a, new type, uh, a different type of dialogue between places of education, places of media, and these communities are often left out of those kind of discussions in terms of their own artistic practice in a way, in terms of their own cultural practice. So I think there's a lot of possibilities that you are talking about when you, when you are saying, let's decolonize it, um, let's decolonize it, let's take it out of this hierarchy of, um, we only need to see how they dance in order to say this public message in order, you know what I mean? Let's take it out of that hierarchy. Let's put it into a space where we can have a dialogue over the art, the philosophy, the worldview, the perceptions. No, it, so, it, yeah. it's, no this is interesting. Um, I also want to think, but before that, I just wanted to say that the questions were, uh, we're, we're happy to answer questions if there are any questions. Um, and can, we can put it in the chat for those that are um, for listeners and viewers. We're happy to answer your questions. Um, while, while we're, I, I'm, um, Brandy told me that there are a lot of um, appreciation and to the conversation and a lot of uh, those that are watching are really enjoying the conversation. So thank you for all your comments of appreciation. If there are questions, we'll be happy to you know speak to them in the many minutes we have. But just wanted to say that I think the discourse or the practice and the discourse of applied theater is also move beyond development. Uh, actually, mm -hmm. theater for development is just a subset of applied theater. It's really okay. considered applied theater as extra anything, you know, extra um uh extra. I'm mean, looking for that word now, is extra. Um, I, I, can't, I can't remember that word now. However, applied theater is, you know, engaging theater beyond that, the professional space itself, like the, the conventional, you know, um, theater space itself, using theater for social realities, for education, for we have theater for development, we have um, a reminiscence theater, we have the victim theater, we have the refugee theater, we have the museum theater, whatever, we, like it's, it's, it's really huge. But I think that, uh, so that's one also, so but what that means is that we're, we've gone beyond that idea of just messaging as theater as a way to send message across. Mm -hmm. It's that where, when you engage with a community, with the people and all of that, there's so much nuance that goes with that from understanding their, like you mentioned, cultural practices, cosmology, their epistem and things like that. 
And so, in my opinion, one of the things that applied theater and other kind of forms, you know, practices that takes us to community and work with community is that it opened access to us for us to actually be able to know human beings better. How can we function together as, as human beings? How can we coexist? How, what are the histories? It opens up just amazing door of opportunity for reckoning, for engaging, for critiquing, for envisioning together that space. And I think that, um, you know, I'm hoping, and that's why I'm really thinking to use your word back again to, to take dramaturgy away from that hierarchical sense or that understanding of what we think it is. Look, take using a decolonial lens to kind of um, ask ourselves what are other questions that are out there when we're devising together with whether professional or not professional or we're doing a piece with um, whether Western canon or not Western canon. And then Africa in this context is that I think there's a lot around our performances, performance traditions, like we rightly said, you know, that's, I think it was when we were talking last time, you did mention that, you know, I think there was uh, one, um, somebody that was using Tente, oh, I think you used Tente in your, tente, your yes. tente, African drums and things like that. And, and you know, the dramaturgy of talking drum, for example, it's something that I, I don't even understand myself as even, even though I'm, I'm Yoruba, um, uh, you know, there's some drum, some things that they play that is only my father that can actually tell you, he, he can tell you this is what they're saying. And that's something that when he, you know, if we hear it, he doesn't even know what it is because, you know, of that aura tradition and all of that, you know, we, we all know that and, you know, um, but then the beauty of that in itself speaks to deeper things about the Yoruba people. Just talking drum alone, you know, you know, our sense of rhythm, you know, the culture around it, the años, right? For example, the families yeah. that are specifically años, those that play drums on it, you know, or the tenta itself, you know, one of the piece uh, that I did in, um, that I uh, created back in Nigeria, you know, we use, you know, are you, up are you, games mm. that are very typical that, you know, now we don't even hear them again because of, uh, you know, video games and all that, right? But, you know, what are those things that we're going back to, to, to really drawing from, you know, from those realities and from those ways of thinking and ways of knowing. So that, that's what I'm really calling for that to say, can we put a lens to that? And what are those skills that are, you know, as dramaturgical skills that we've taken on, maybe because of our geography or because of our location and the kind of work that we're doing. So we have practitioners from Burkina Faso, from Kenya, Egypt, Nigeria, really South Africa drawing from all of these experiences. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important because, you know, I keep seeing this statistic pop popping up all over the place that, uh, is it 65% of Africa is under 30 or something like that. I don't know how true it is, but I see that it's a very youthful place. But, and I'm also very aware of the increasing divide intergenerationally, you know, and the big divide sometimes urban to rural. I mean, when I travel sometimes from Lagos to Ife, it's like, I've traveled a long way in the sense that I enter into community who speak Yoruba very differently from the way they do in Lagos and have a different, my posture, physical posture changes when I get to Ife. The way I will stand and greet people, it's, there's a, a, a different knowledge. But I was aware at the funeral of my mother, how much <laughs> I did not know. Mm. And how much he had died with. You know, and I'm aware that unless, I mean, the way we have constituted theater uh, within Africa um, and we create theater, great, we have theater courses. I see the power of dramaturgy uh, as, as a discipline now, if we think about it in a disciplined way, is a way of us looking at the logic of our practices, not just learning a repertoire piece. You know, I always say that, you know, when I dance, uh, you know, I, you take part in a choreography, you learn a few steps of bata and a few rhythms of the drum in order to do that particular performance. But if someone threw me out there with the drama and, a, and the dance, I possibly could not cope with more than five minutes. <laughs> You know what I mean? Because I've learned everything through a play. You know what I mean? Right. But I think dramaturgy 
it is an arena because you're learning about logic, you're learning about principles and modes of communication to start approaching many of these practices, not just for how do I learn enough for my performance, but how do I learn it as a language? Mm. How and I and I think this will help um, relationships between different uh, institutions. I think it will help passing down uh, um, information between generations, for example. That's right. You know? I, I agree. Mm. Yeah, and if 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 younger scholars start come approaching performance dramaturgically, they will probably know a different set of questions to to ask That's elders. Right than the ones they they ask now and I think it's different from the anthropological study of culture where you go and watch and then record and then perform or understand it I think it's a bit more of a, of a dialogic way of engaging with 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 culture That's so true. I think it will change the link between the professional and the community and the That's link right. between uh, the stage and what, what some people will say, the field and the stage, or, you know, it, it will change a different link, which I think is, is, is needed, I think, in, right. in, in, in the continent. Uh, and, I, and I think in addition to that, beyond the continent is that migration has sort of made the world what it is right now. Mm. That even though I'm in Regina right now, you have Yorubas, you have those that are from Ethiopia, you have those that are from South Africa, the same thing for you in London where you are, the same way for other places, you know, and not in all over the world, is that migration has sort of also opened up opportunity where all these things can become useful in those are bubbles, right? So that you can you can see, you know, what that means, what that look like. You don't have to necessarily go to, you know, that part of the world before you see that. But then also the new generation, the, you know, the new generation or generation that are coming, what would that, um, you know, what would that, you know, what that would look like? And in the context of indigenous, you know, um, epistems and realities also here in Canada and in, in some other part of the world, um, is that that in itself also create that opportunity for us to start understanding other nuanced ways and other ways of doing things. Um, I think we have a question here. Um, um, uh, thanks for the wonderful conversation, Taiwan, for me, really very inspiring. At the lab, we discussed that there is often a dramaturgical focus with regards to story content, text and storytelling. How about visuals slash design, non-text? Are the questions different for you both? Um, so that's first question. Uh, and then the second question, also any words of advice for the PACE Dramaturgical Lab participant as they are navigating this world of dramaturgy in the coming ones, uh, months, what questions do you have for them? And what uh, question do you feel they should think about? Okay, two, two Ogologbo questions. <laughs> <laughs> big questions. <laughs> yeah, I mean, big questions, so it's Ogologbo questions. I don't know, Ty, would you want to go first? I don't mind, whatever. Well, yeah, absolutely. And I think that the question is not just for dramaturgical lab, uh, peace dramaturgical lab alone. It's, it's a dramaturgical question for uh, anyone that is in, that does that, whether they label themselves dramaturg, uh, dramaturgy or not. A dramaturg or not, uh, is that in my opinion, yes, um, there is, um, there has to be a consideration, dramaturgical consideration for both the story content, the storytelling, whether you're devising or scripted, and also the visual dimension of it. Because many times also what constitute the aesthetics, so when we're talking about the political, the, the, the aesthetics and the humane, the visual constituting that part of that. So I'll give an example. Um, when, you know, some couple of months ago with BLM movement um, and all the uproar and all of that, there's a particular, I think a particular Monday or a particular day that folks wanted to do, you know, solidarity and they put a particular picture on their, you know, on the avatar, on their profile on social media. Um, I think some couple of years ago also there was uh, something that happened in, uh, in France where we had pray for Fl France all over the internet. There's also the orange you know, shirt day here in Canada. Those things are visual representation of not just an event, but a people, uh, an event, a circumstance, and things like that. So in my opinion, I think that a dramaturgical focus should consider both of them. They are not, they are not different questions we should be asking. 
In fact, there are additional questions that should add on to that conversation because we know that the visual is very powerful. Um, the design is very powerful. The non-text, the paralinguistics, you know, the, the sign language, the metaphors, the symbolism, those things are the imagery. Those things are very important. That, that's what I want, I'm gonna say over to you for me. Yeah. Uh, the visual is very important. As, as we said, I think dramaturgy as a, as a, as a practice has increased with the fact that more performances are not reliant on a play text. And if they're not reliant on a script, what are they reliant on? Yes, they might still be speaking and singing, but it has a lot to do with the visuals and the movement and the physicality and who the performances are. And that comes down a lot to, to, to visual. So you could, you, the fact that, for example, one performance, the beginning was um, the, the director just asked the cast each to come with an object that is of great significance to them. They brought the object to the studio and then they explained why this particular object was of so, such importance. And then it was the stories from the objects, the use of the objects that were created the performance. And then there had to be a selection of which ones to focus on most because uh, you couldn't put everything in. But some other objects continued in the piece, sort of in the background. And, and, and the tension between those objects in the foreground and the background, you know, though there was a tension between them that also created a meaning. And this is by the visuals, you know? Um, so what we what we see is as important as what we uh, as what we hear. So visuals are very impressive. They they contain they have meanings like Taiwo was saying the um, BLM and uh, the banners, the motives, the logos. They mean something. And just very quickly to uh, what I would like to encourage members of the lab to do is explore their own lives and how they make meaning with it. Is there a bracelet they like to wear every day? Is there songs they like to listen to? Are there things that their mothers and fathers told them they hold on to closely? And then if those things, if you catalog those things and, and you begin to see what makes meaning in your life and holds meaning, then you begin to start seeing what must be happening with other people. Well, this is amazing. I think we're just going to wrap it up here because we have just uh, less than um, one minute um, to, <laughs> um, fi uh, to finish. Um, but we just want to say th thank you so much for me for being part of this. I know that you're coming back in episode three, I believe, yeah. um, to, with, with uh, Judy Dadder and, and, some, and some other um, amazing uh, practitioners across the, um, you know, from the continent. Uh, thank you for taking the time to engage and have this conversation. And I'm um, looking forward to engaging with uh, uh, the participants in the dermatological lab. And also to we look forward to the remaining four sessions. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you to Brendan, to um, you know, all the partners, including HowlRound, uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, Sarika and Deb, uh, and of course, to our live captioners. Uh, thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing you in our next episode. Uh, from, uh, from my own end here, uh, thank you for coming to the Colonizing Dramatology series, and we look forward to seeing you next. Bye, everyone.